empty seats up here. Three empty seats. No one afraid of the front row? Not Ricky. Ricky's not afraid. Just don't block the camera. You're good. How's everybody doing today? Good. So glad that you all are here. My name is Ashley Jones. I'm the community program manager here at the Venture Center. Before I introduce James, I just wanted to give you a brief overview of, of what the Venture Center is, how we help entrepreneurs. Um, our tagline is educate, collaborate, accelerate, and that pretty much encompasses what we do. We educate folks about entrepreneurship and workforce development through the many programs that we run throughout the year. Uh, we collaborate with other <coughs> entrepreneur support organizations, colleges, any company that has similar missions and values as we do, and then we uh, accelerate the companies that we work with as well. You'll notice some, some company names around here. This is for our Spark Pre-Accelerator program that we currently run to help grow these businesses. So all of our programs are designed to do that. And real quick, we're gonna start doing this at uh, all of our workshops and functions. If you would, take a second to check in on Facebook. Tell folks that you were here and help us grow our network and reach more people. So check it on Facebook, and if you take a picture or happen to tag yourself, use the hashtag VVC and hashtag innovation happens here. That'll be going forward as we put on these programs. So today, we're all here to hear from James Hendren. He is the former co-founder, CEO, and chairman of Arkansas Systems. He also happens to be the chairman of our board here at the Venture Center. And he's going to teach you all the tips and tricks and tools that you need to know before you have your next investor meeting. So without further ado, please welcome James Hendren. Well, thank you for that nice welcome there. Uh, let me ask you a question. How many of you, it's the first time to be at the Venture Center? Wow, nice. Welcome, all of you. That's fantastic. We're glad to, we're glad to have you here. Let me, I'll give you just a little bit of my, my background to help you see where I'm, I'm coming from. Uh, I went off and worked in the Defense Department industry after I got out of college, worked on shooting down nuclear weapons with nuclear weapons and some, some stuff like that on the software side of that. Came back to Arkansas, I, I grew up in Hot Springs. Came back to Arkansas and uh, with a couple of friends to start Arkansas Systems, ArcSys. Uh, I sold that to Euronet Worldwide, if you're familiar with them, they still have all their development uh, here in Little Rock. Uh, and towards the end of that and since then, I got really interested in helping build the entrepreneurial ecosystem in, uh, in Arkansas. So uh, did a bunch of things, served uh, eight years on the Economic Development Commission as a commissioner and served eight years on the board of the Arkansas Science and Technology Authority and actually helped create a lot of the incentives that are, that are available uh, for, for startups kind of took all the incentives that were aimed back from the 60s for kind of manufacturing and added, we didn't take anything away, added incentives uh, for startup for startup companies. So all the ones that you run into, uh, I had at least some hand in that, writing the legislation, designing some of the programs. Uh, but uh, a big piece of what we did is created a group called Accelerate Arkansas. And it's, we just picked the biggest, hardest uh, metric to move, which was to increase the average income of our pensions as a percentage of the national average. And during the years that we worked on that, we actually uh, moved us up, while all the other states are trying to do the same thing, moved ourselves up in the ranking about seven places and moved up our percentage of income for our Kansans uh, up about eight percentage points. And, you know, we didn't do all of that. I wasn't all done, obviously, from things that we did, but uh, we did a lot of things to, to kind of kind of change that. Well, a piece of what all of that was, we created, uh, I helped co-found a number of uh, investment funds, angel funds, uh, 
I run the angel funds that is best in the uh, FinTech Accelerator that the, that the Venture Center uh, does and uh, created a number of mentoring type organizations. And then uh, a couple of us co-founded the Venture Center. And that was to take some of the programs that were all kind of in government move them to the private sector. Uh, the Venture Center is a, is a non-profit. We run a bunch of different programs and then some associated uh, investment funds that are tied to the accelerator, as I, as I mentioned. So, so uh, I do a ton of mentoring. I've mentored a number of the folks here in the, in the audience one time or another have been investing in a lot of different companies and a bunch of different funds serve on a number of uh, boards of, of startups. So that's, that's kind of my background. Uh, so it's really important for people to kind of understand what we always call the Arkansas systems. Which hat do you have on uh, when, you're, when you're talking? So we made a big point of paying attention to the difference when we were having a meeting of the managers where we talk about operational issues and how do we get things done versus the board, which is a more strategic type of, of position. And an investor, to get to the topic here, is interested in both of those levels and, is, and they're interested in knowing that you as a, as a, as a company know those uh, requirements that it takes to deal with governance, uh, have the right team players on the board, have the right team players on your on your management team. You know, even if you're a small startup, which is you know, one or two or three or, or four employees, you still have to have management. It has to be managed. You have to know where you're going. You got to have kind of plan of where where you're going to get. And the investors are interested in in looking and understanding uh, all of those type of things. So today, I need to be careful and let you know that I'm wearing the hat today to talk to you as an investor would. So don't confuse things that I say about what I see a typical investor uh, looking at with a company with what I might do working with you as a mentor. So I'm trying to, trying to separate those two. So today I'm gonna to be the big bad investor that you might <laughs> with to get some funds, okay? <laughs> Uh, so, what are what are some things? So, from that that viewpoint, what we're going to talk through is about what are things that investors really look for. How do they make their decisions about uh, what they're going to invest in, and kind of how all that process works. Uh, if you have questions, we can talk about more specifically some of those processes and legal entities and those type of things. I'm not going to particularly cover that unless you, unless you have some questions <coughs> uh, but there's kind of a whole list of list of things that investors look at the scary thing from you as as company management is an investor looks at your company and they're going to put money in it and they're trying to decide if they put whether to put money in based on whether they're going to get a return now there's different kinds of things to invest in, right? Everything from a savings account that pays you a fraction of a percent, you know, of interest, but it's really, really safe by regulation, by laws. Uh, even if it crashes, it's insured, and you're gonna get your money back, right? So you got stuff that's very, very safe, low return, but steady, you know that return's gonna be there. Yeah. You know, you get to see these and on and on and, and on. Uh, so uh, the other end is kind of what, what most of you all are talking about, that somebody invests in my company that's pretty early or is trying to change how they're going to market, uh, trying to bring some money in to do something different, but typically uh, pretty early and it's really, really high risk. The chances of money getting invested in a startup company and getting a return coming back really pretty low, and you got to keep in mind that the investor is looking at it. 
It doesn't seem fair to you, but if you think about it, if you're a diverse, if you're investing and you want to diversify so that, uh, you know, your stockbroker asks you to diversify, getting different kinds of companies and in different industries, so as those industries vary by the economy, that you don't all go crashing down all at once. Well, investing in startups is kind of the same way, and that uh, you've got all these really high risk ones, you've got a few that are going to be really successful and you get a nice return back. You're going to have a few that maybe you get your money back and you're going to have a bunch of them. You're not going to get anything back. So from the investor's point of view, they've got an average over everything they invest in where they get a good return back for the risk that they've taken to invest in your, in your company. So again, that's going to seem unfair to you, but so they have to be looking for opportunities that can produce that really great return to make up for all of the, I lose everything or, or my money sits in the company for seven years and maybe I get exactly what my money back if, if I'm lucky. So that means that they're gonna look at your company really closely. They're gonna figure out what's the opportunity here. Is there an opportunity for, this one's really gonna hack you off to get 10, 15, 20 times the money I get back that I put in back in some kind of a time frame. Well, that sounds really awful, but if you if you put uh, your money in, say 10 companies and eight of them fail or six of them fail, you gotta make up for all of that money that you lost. And then some you just get your money back, so that's a wash. And then those one or two out of ten that do really well have to make up for all the, all the rest of that. So when the investor sits in there and, and looks at that company, there's another scary point here. They are looking for what's the likelihood of failure? Where can failure come from? If I can not find the failure point, and everything else is is there have a good chance for a, for a good return. So then we'll look at, let's just go through a bunch of the list. Yes, they'll look at the product. Uh, what's the product like? Does it look like that the product really solves a problem? Almost no investors, very few investors will invest in something that, hey, I've just got this great idea that, the technologies need or it's you need something out there but it doesn't solve a problem for the for the who are buying it whether that's a company or the consumer or, or whatever it solves a problem that they have or it delivers something that they that they already buy cheaper or a little better well cheaper or a little better is that's the kind of company that you know might be successful but it's not going to have a huge increase in, in uh, value. So that one may not be something that, that you can really get a lot of investment money back unless you, you know, find an investor that really gets excited about, about what you're doing. They love the industry or they, you know, love the, the sector that it's, that it's in, or they have a lot of experience there. They think they can help you leverage that. Most, Equity investors, now we're talking about equity, not loans and debt. <coughs> so when that overlaps, we can talk about that a little bit. But the equity investor is looking for that. What is the new thing that's going to solve a problem that's out there? So when people come in and says, I'd like to be an entrepreneur, I'd like to start my own company, I want to be in charge of my future and, and my opportunities, you know, what can I do? The answer to that is look at what you you do already, where your life is, and look and see what are the things that drive you crazy. What are the things that if I could if I could solve, if I can make this better, it would make my life greater. And then look and see if that applies to a bunch of other people. So a lot of folks think to go out and start a new company and make it big is 
really, I'm going to have some unique, super high-tech technology. No, you have to have something that solves a problem that either it's really, really valuable to solve that problem and I need 50 customers and I'm rich and famous and all of that, or it's a problem that a lot of people have and I can solve it with a good margin on it. You know, either case can get the, the big numbers and big numbers on, on the bottom line. So, and there's, how many of you are familiar with the lean canvas? Okay, the ones that aren't, you might want to just look that up in the search engine. Lean canvas is kind of on one page, a summary to look at a whole bunch of different parts of what it takes to be successful. And the very first box you're going to fill out is there's, what's the problem? What's the problem I'm going to try to solve? And the next one is, what is my solution? And you may have multiple solutions, uh, but you're going to kind of focus in on one or two. Uh, and then you're going to evaluate your three or four or five possibility solutions and pick them up as best solution. And it covers a whole bunch of other things. What's the, the market? Who's gonna buy this thing? Uh, go talk to potential customers. What do they say about it? Uh, what's your marketing plan? How are you gonna go to market? What's your cost to produce your product? And a bunch of other things. That is a really good first summary for your investor to look at. This kind of summarizes your whole whole company on one sheet of paper, a big sheet of paper, or some all over, whatever it takes to express that. But that's really a good summary. And people write executive summaries, you know, a couple of two or three pages, and those are useful. But that lean canvas really covers most of the basis of, of what an investor wants to know enough to decide whether they want to look deeper. So that, that's, that's a good piece of, good piece of tool for you, uh, for you to use. And there's a number of groups that even do little training sessions on that, the Venture Center and those other, 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 other people do. So the link, link canvas is valuable. Now, that investor, remember, is saying, what's the likelihood they're not asking what's the likelihood the company is going to make it big. They're, you know, that potential has to be there. What they're really asking is how likely is it to fail? And the investor only has to find one thing in all the dozens and dozens of things they look at that go major point of failure come out. You ever watch Shark Tank? That's what they do. One major possibility for failure come out. The investors are pretty much the same way. And that makes presenting to customers hard because over, over time as you work on it, you figure out what are those weak points. I'm gonna go solve those weak points. I'm gonna have the answer to that question about <coughs> that, that uh, a weak point. Uh, so that actually talking to investors and getting those hard questions back to the investors back from the investors give you the opportunity to, to improve your company because it might be a, an issue with your company you never thought about or it might be one you loosely thought about and all of a sudden somebody's asked the question where you realize ooh that really is important I really need to figure out uh, figure out uh, that solution so what are other points of failure uh, that the investor is going to look at well, team, team, team. What's the team? Who's who's gonna make this thing happen? Uh, when I talk to entrepreneurial classes, uh, I really point out that uh, a cross-functional team really usually makes the, the very best kind of opportunity. You see companies that put together that it's, you know, three scientists, or three engineers, or three accountants, or three whatever, three <laughs> different things. And they may be really good in those categories that are there, but that usually means they have a whole lot of stuff that they don't have any experience about at all. The three engineers may build this fantastic product, 
so they don't have a clue how to get it to market and get it sold and and do the accounting and and do cash flow projections to figure out how I'm not going to run out of money three weeks from now. Uh, it takes that cross-functional team usually to, to make a successful company. So go back and look at at your your team and see if there are any missing pieces. The investor doesn't necessarily have to see all those people on your team to see all of those things covered. Part, when you're in an early stage company, part of what that investor is saying, do you know what you're missing on your team? Do you know how to get there and when you're going to be able to get there both time-wise and budget-wise? So it's okay to have the missing pieces. The investor wants to know, you know it, you have a plan for how to deal with it at some point. So that's not necessarily a killer. The killer is, oh, I don't need those kind of folks. <coughs> Bye, I'm gone. You know, kind of, kind of reaction there. Uh, so what are some other things to look at? Okay, they will look at the product. Uh, is, does it look like you really have it designed into it, whether it's a hardware product, a consumer product, a piece of software, whatever. Do you have designed into it the pieces are going to make it easy to use, uh, really solve the problem, uh, are there missing pieces? Now you can get trapped into, oh, it's not selling, so I just need to add this feature. Oh, it's not selling, I need to add this new feature. And all of a sudden, time has run by, a lot of dollars have gone out the door, and you're still using the excuse, oh, I can make it better, so then it will sell. Be careful you don't get trapped into that either. And the investor will be watching for that. So the investor comes in and makes a pitch and they start talking about all of the things they added to the product and you go, well, who's bought it? Well, nobody yet, but when you put some more money in and I have these three more features, somebody's gonna buy it. That's probably a formula for, no, I'm not gonna invest. So the product needs to solve the problem but it doesn't need to be over over invested in. It can get better over time with sales, uh, but you probably, that concept of minimum viable product, the minimum number of feature functions that somebody's gonna buy the, the product and, and start using it, that's an important concept uh, uh, to keep up with. Uh, other things that uh, are gonna be uh, of interest to them, I'm kind of a numbers guy. It sounds like you probably figured that out by now. So I really like to see a performer. So you're you're doing a projection of what your financials are gonna look like over time. So to do a good performer, you've got a lot of things you gotta do. You have to project what you're gonna sell, how many widgets you're gonna sell, how much it's gonna cost you to produce that uh, widget, how much you can sell it for, what that growth in sales over time is going to look like, and what are all of the risk of all the support costs involved in getting to that. So I've got to have engineering to do design maybe, or I have to have, uh, depending on back there on the link campus, how I'm going to go to market. If I'm selling to distributors, I've got to have folks that work with those distributors convince them to keep pushing my product, finding out what's bothering them. Do their salespeople need training? So that's that's a set of expertise that you might need. If you're selling directly, what's your marketing plan? What's your sales plan? Who's gonna sell it? What's their expertise? Uh, and all of those have costs to it. So all of those costs will, will show up. Typically, that kind of performer you wanna see you know, job types, not necessarily individual. If I've got, you know, so many salespeople, the next number goes up in six months and nine months or whatever it is, and they cost such and such amount, and maybe they get a commission, so that's some more, some more cost, and kind of broken down by category. And uh, then all the other costs, you know, chipping, insurance, rent, uh, IT, so 
It sounds like a big job. It is a big job. Now, what am I, an investor, looking for there? You think I'm believe, gonna believe what your three-year-out sales projections are? I'm not gonna believe this year's sales projections. What I'm looking for is, if you analyze your business well enough to really understand what it's gonna to take to get it done, are there key pieces missing? Are there assumptions in there that aren't gonna fly? Like you're gonna have this top super salesperson that's you're going to pay twenty thousand dollars a year. Not very likely. Uh, so you're looking to see: Do you have a good concept of what it's really going to take from a financial point of view uh, to go forward? And sometimes you'll see in there things like, "Well, in the twelfth month of the first year, I'm going to have sold a million widgets," and you go, mm, "No, I don't think so." Uh, you know, could happen, but depending on what the product is and what industry, do the sales figures make sense? Do the cost of all the pieces make sense? Again, the investor's looking for where's the point of failure? You don't understand about sales. You don't understand about, about whatever. Uh, you haven't factored in rent. You've got some real expensive piece of machinery you have to have to manufacture your widgets and and yeah you've got it in there and you've got it appreciated over time where the cash come from to pay for it the you know, when you had to buy it. So those kind of holes are what the investors are looking like at when they see your performa. And they're also, you know, looking to see what's your mental attitude about what you're gonna be able to do with the with the company. It's not going to be, uh, you know, everybody that ever did a performa that presents to an investor, the first thing they'll tell you is, this is a conservative performa. <laughs> Excuse me, bullshit. <laughs> it is, everybody's performance is always conservative from their point of view. And uh, usually it's not, usually I feel fantastic about this company. I've got all this enthusiasm. We're going to do all this stuff, and you and you overestimate. That's fine. Uh, you want the investor wants the management team and all those folks to be enthusiastic, to be giving their all, to be feeling good about good about the company, and they're going to just kind of discount some of that. That's not a problem. But I will give you a little hint. Don't come tell me it's a conservative performance because I'm not going to believe you. I'm just going to say, well. You're not paying attention. Uh, so, but me and a lot of investors really want to see that performance because it really digs down into your vision and what you've considered and what you might uh, might not have uh, considered. Uh, some people really care about the the uh, type of uh, entity that you've that you've created. Uh, some people will tell you an investor will only invest in a C corporation. Let me tell you that's not true. Uh, now when you get to a, when you're really grown and you get big and you're maybe going after venture capital, venture capitalist money, many of them will want it to be a, a C corporation. Uh, but that's probably a long ways down the road for you. There are real advantages to be in an LLC, for example, in my opinion. The investor has the opportunity for those front end years when you run it at a loss, that loss passes through on a form called a K-1. So profits and losses pass through to the investors in an LLC. And so they can put their money in your company and take the losses in your company and and deduct them off of their income tax. So there's an income tax advantage, and it's kind of a double advantage. You reduce, when you take those deductions, you reduce what's called the basis, the value of your investment, from a tax point of view only, uh, from a tax point of view, and then later the company sells and there's a, a big increase. So you put this much in, you had losses, now maybe the investor's value 
from a tax point of view is this amount to sell the company out here and yeah, you have to pay capital gains on on that difference in the new basis and the amount you sold it for. But you got to deduct part of this as ordinary income and now you're paying capital gains on, on the growth. So there's advantages from a tax point of view. Uh, there's advantages uh, to, to you. You have, you have uh, ownership, you're paying yourself a value, a uh, you know, salary, you're, you're gonna pay taxes on that. You get part of those losses passed on to you for, to reduce your tax basis and, and you don't have to pay yourself as much because it's not as, you don't have to pay the taxes as much. So for that reason, and some people have tried to tell you you can't do warrants, you can't do options, you can do all of those things at, at LLCs. LLCs can do basically anything a C-Corp can. It's just treated for tax purposes. So that's a personal issue with me. You'll, you'll hear people argue the other side of that because someday you're going to want to want a VC in here and you're going to need to be a, a C-Corp. It's pretty easy to change. It's harder to change from a C-Corp back to an LLC. It's pretty easy to change from a LLC, Limited Liability Corporation, from an LLC to a, to a C-Corp. So uh, that's uh, some of that type of stuff. In Arkansas, uh, a lot of investors have become very familiar with the uh, equity investment tax credit that AEDC uh, can, can give you. Uh, the way it works, there's a, a, a defined list of targeted businesses, usually means it's around technology somehow or another, that definition is very, very loose, and they define a whole bunch of industry segments. And if you're in one of those industry segments, you can go apply to the Economic Development Commission, Arkansas Economic Development Commission, AEDC, uh, for an equity investment tax credit. This is to help get more money into, uh, into startups. So it's an incentive from the state to help you raise money. Now this isn't an incentive that's gonna go directly to the company, but it's an incentive to help you raise money. There's a lot of folks in Arkansas that are willing to invest in things that they can touch and feel and kick. You know, they're used to investing in buildings and you know, real estate and tractors and equipment, things you can touch. Uh, but there are not as many people used to investing in things that are based on intellectual property, uh, ideas, software, all those type of things. So to help those folks be able to raise money, before we get to that, let me sidestep a minute. Where are banks in this picture? Banks by regulation, by law, have to be very, very safe. And that's what all the regulators, all of it, all of, anything you hear out there that sounds horrible, it's all designed to make a bank safe. So your money is safe when you put it in the bank. The whole philosophy of banks are, are built on that. So as such, bank regulators look at all the loans that they've made and dink them for things that are their bad loans. Think about it, if you're a banker, and you come in and make a, a loan that has no collateral, it's not guaranteed by anybody that has any net worth so that they could pay the, pay the loan off. There's no hard assets that the bank can take and sell to get part of their money back. Those are the kind of things that many startups are sitting in that kind of situation would like to borrow money from the bank. The bank is not supposed to make those kind of loans. So what happens, the regulators come in and see those kind of loans and they say, okay, you loan $100,000 to Bill, you have to take out of your assets and set them aside in the reserve $100,000 that you can't lend out, has to be set aside. So now all of a sudden, me as a banker, 
I just had to set aside two hundred thousand dollars my assets to loan a hundred thousand to you. And the banker goes, No, 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 I'm not gonna do that. Because that's obviously money losing situation for them. So by regulation, by the laws, banks really aren't supposed to be doing those kind of those kind of loans. And if they do, they're big negative incentives for them. So uh, unless you've got a rich uncle or an investor who's willing to co-sign loans for you, uh, banks typically, or if you have hard assets to to pledge, I mean, buildings, equipments, tractors, all those kind of things, all of those are things banks are supposed to do. So if you don't have all of any of that, and you have to raise money by selling equity, ownership in your company, this DITC program, Equity Investment Tax Credit, are designed to help incent the investor to invest in those, those kind of situations. So what's the advantage to the company? The advantage to the company is it helps them raise money. What's the advantage to the investor? They get to deduct one third of what they invest off of their income tax. So in essence, they're making a dollar that they invest, assuming that they can actually deduct all of it, there's a lot of different rules, but the dollar that they invest, they really only have 67 cents at risk. So that's a huge incentive. It's a, it's a really, really big help. But that's the theory of that incentive, is to help that sector uh, of our economy. There's a, also incentives out there that, uh, that help encourage the company to develop products, to make their products better, to do new product that's called an R&D tax credit. And for those same set of, there's two different kinds, there would be two different kinds. Uh, these targeted businesses can get an incentive for up to five years when the company's new, where every dollar that you spend on developing product, one third of that, the state writes you a check back. You get cash back for one third of those expenses you send on R and D. That's a huge incentive. Now there's some other incentives for R and D that kind of go on forever, but they're not nearly as lucrative to that. You get to uh, to deduct your increase in R and D that you spend each year, uh, and that's both state and federal. So there's different combinations of that, depending on where you are and what, what kind of business you are. But all of those kind of incentives to the investor are leverage. It's either you know, a tax credit that I get right back that I can use to save my, to lower my risk. It's a, a check that's gonna come from the state, from R&D, that's gonna help lower your cost to, to develop product. And there's other incentives uh, out there, but Anything that qualifies for those kind of incentives also kind of uh, in, uh, excite the investor uh, somewhat. Uh, so let's see, what are some other things uh, the investors uh, are looking like? What does your board of directors look like? Maybe you have an advisory committee that have experts across the industry. You have all of the right kind of experts you have to, uh, to it to advise you. Uh, all of those things are positives uh, to the to the investor. Uh, they're looking for where are the holes and expertise, whether you've got them on staff, whether you've got them as advisors, all of those things are, are good things. But the investor again is looking, what's the point of failure here? I don't have anybody that's knowledgeable in this sector that you need advice on and you obviously don't have any knowledge there or you have, have much expertise there. Uh, so that's a, another thing that uh, investors are looking for. Let's see what else I wrote down on this. Um, I kind of said it earlier, but uh, it, your product that you're taking to market that solves a problem, how unique is it? Uh, the, uh, another favorite thing that will turn an investor off and they'll walk away is 
is uh, when you come up and say, my solution is absolutely unique. There's no competitor out there. There's nobody, nobody's gonna compete with me. Everybody that looks at it's gonna buy it. Well, there's always a competitor. There's, however they're doing it today, there's a competitor. There's always a competitor. There's a problem out there. Somebody's dealing with it uh, some way or another. So, uh, but how unique is the solution is a key piece that really can excite the uh, accelerator. Um, another thing that gets looked at is what are the executive salaries look like? If they're uh, really, really high, really, really expensive, uh, that's gonna turn some investors off. Uh, and, you, and you have people that you see, you know, had senior positions with, you know, a large corporate company and they wanna go out on their own and, and they say, this is what our family is used to uh, living on and, I've got my two or three friends that I brought from the corporate environment and I'm paying each one of them $300,000 or whatever. Uh, investors kind of go, mm, you're kind of early to be paying those kind of salaries. That means you got to have a whole lot more money for your runway to, to run out of money uh, and you're going to be back out in the market trying to raise money. Are you going to be able to raise to raise the money, or you're gonna run out of money. Maybe you got the best product in the world and the customers would love you, but you ran out of money and you can't raise more. Point of fact, your company dies. Uh, so, a lot of different things uh, when you're putting your investor pits together and, and that's, that's another, another thing. You know, if you went to, business school a decade or two ago and you had a, a new company, they're gonna teach you that you're gonna write a business plan, you know, it's this thick. And, uh, you know, the first the first sections are gonna say, I'm gonna tell you what I'm gonna tell you about, and, you know, and then they come in and say, well, in these situations, I'm gonna tell you about it, and then the next session is I'm gonna tell you more about it, and then in the end, this is what I was gonna tell you about. Nobody reads those things anymore. So those person months of effort that went into it are really overdue. They're gonna look at performance, they're gonna look at executive summaries, they're gonna look at clean canvases, and they're gonna look at details that you have in your pitch. The pitches really kinda of go in two pieces. One is the pitch that you give uh, when you're talking to a, you know, a small group or a large group and it's gonna have very few words, big bullet points, big <coughs> font, and uh, so that the people can see it, and so they're not reading three or four paragraphs and not listening to you, and some nice diagrams, some pictures, some things like that. Uh, Venture Center has outlines of good investor pitches that I'd be glad to share with you. Uh, and then the other one is the pitch that uh, maybe you're just going to kind of follow up while you talk to somebody sitting at the table, but you're going to give them to take it away, and it's got a lot more detail because they're going to, because you're wanting them to take it away and read more detail of what your main bullets were apart. So it can be the exact same pitch with one for a formal presentation and another one with how much more detail and sentences and paragraphs underneath your bullet points for them to take away, because nobody absorbs everything you're gonna tell them about your, about your company. You're gonna get excited about it. You're gonna uh, skip some things. You're gonna uh, talk over it. Uh, their mind's gonna wander. They're gonna miss some of it. So it's nice to have that pitch with a whole lot of data and information filled in. So if they really have an interest, they can read about it later and be reminded of the important points that you told them. So uh, pitches are really important. Get some help to some from some folks that have uh, uh, really worked a lot on pitches and can tell you. Uh, I think you got a problem here. Investor is going to like this. This is this 
scary point you're going to do for the investor. I really wouldn't say that. Or, hey, you didn't cover this at all. Venture Center does a lot of that in mentoring. Feel free to check with Ashley, who introduced us, and she can help you get with a, a mentor to, to go over uh, pitches. Uh, so, and that's the other thing. Don't be afraid to ask for, for people to, uh, you know, review your stuff, give you feedback, give you mentoring. I have helped many, many people do pitches and fine tune pitches that I may end up investing in the company later. And I know what I said, well, don't say that, that's scary. Mm -hmm. And it's still I may invest in them. That's why you put my different different hats on it. Don't be afraid to ask somebody for, for help and, and get some feedback because you can waste presenting to a bunch of people until you find out something that's in there that's really, really turning them on. Do that with a mentor or somebody that can really help you, really help you get there on that. So I guess summary wise is that investor is really looking for that super idea that's gonna solve a problem and it's gonna make you rich and you're gonna make that person have some more money and <laughs> they love it, they're excited about it, they wanna invest in you, uh, but they're not gonna invest in something that looks like it's got a high probability of, of failure. So that's some of the things I wanted to talk to you about. Let's open it up for questions and. See what kind of things are really on really on your mind. Questions? Sure. When building an advisory board, do you have to pay those people? Uh, it depends. A lot of advisory boards are not paid. Uh, sometimes you might set a little piece of stock beside for them or give them some options. Options. Uh, most people know what those are, but for you, it's, it's the option to purchase stock sometime in the future at today's price. So, so what you're doing is you're kind of giving somebody that's helping you the opportunity to be involved when you're good and valuable, uh, and not have to take any kind of tax event by getting stock given to you now that might have some valuation. So, might do that, but a lot of times you can have an advisory board that's just all volunteer and they just enjoy being there and enjoy helping you enjoy seeing what's going on in the industry. So I know that's not a very specific answer. Yes? What advice would you give to say pre risk and I'm sorry, say one more time. What advice would you give to a pre revenue entrepreneur to So you have no risk. And you want to raise money. And you want to raise money. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, as you fill in as many of those pieces as we've talked about as you can. Uh, it's you very seldom, unless it's just a really good, you know, a good friend or or somebody that's involved in the industry. Seldom are you going to get money when you just go describe it on the back of a the napkin. They want to look for those points of failure. But a lot of investors will invest when you're pre revenue. Uh, the thing that you have to accept is the, the value of your company uh, to that investor or to anybody who's going to be lower until you start to have some, some revenue. But that's just kind of what it costs to get some of those funds on, on, the, on the front end. But if you can tell a good story and uh, you, know, you have your performance together, and you know your team needs to be, but you don't, you don't have it all right now. And it really solves a problem. Lots of times you can find somebody that will invest, but they're gonna invest in the company, say maybe you have for investment that's gonna worth a million dollars instead of telling me it's worth $10 million right now. Well, cops, it's a great idea. Mm -hmm. so, does that help? Yeah. Yes. How much does an investor get involved in your decision making. How much does the investor get involved? That can vary all over the place. An investor is, to be honest, is kind of like getting married. You got to decide that you, uh, somebody that you're compatible with, that you, uh, some investors will put the money in and you'll never hear back from them except maybe once a year saying, what am I going to get my tax information? 
and other investors are investing because they want to be highly involved. And you and some of them, if they're experts in the industry, you know that may be great. Um, but it's really kind of important. That it's not just a one-way decision based on investors. You, you need to have enough communication with them to know if you're compatible and you can work together and what those expectations of their involvement is. It is okay for somebody to come up and say, I want to put $100,000 in your company and you don't think you're going to be compatible with them. Say no, because that's, the horse is nasty. <laughs> whether that's in any type of situation. So how much equity is an investment you would look to get? Uh, how much equity is an investor looking to get? That's, there's no real answer to that. Basically, you have an opinion of what your company is worth today, and maybe some premium for what it's going to be worth a little bit down the line. The investor has an opinion of how much that company is worth, so you kind of establish a valuation, and then you're selling a percentage of that. So if the company's worth 10 million, and you're putting Hundred thousand in, you know, you're not getting roughly one percent. But it's real early stage, and uh, you know, maybe it'll be worth four hundred thousand dollars, and hundred thousand dollars is twenty percent. Four or four hundred plus one is five hundred a year. Into the investment. Any guidelines where you think it's a bad deal for the uh, the business owner? And so on, yes, what's a bad deal for the business owner? It depends on that the evaluation of your company, what you think the value is, and what they think the value, if you're too far apart on that, uh, it's a bad deal. If you aren't going to be compatible, it's, it's a bad deal. It's really, can you, the two of you agree on the valuation on which you're going to put money into? Uh, some, some things are, the things to really watch. And how bad do you need money? You know, obviously that's a piece of it. Things where folks really, a lot of times are not too happy is if you need a whole lot of money and you can't convince anybody that you get a real top valuation and after the end of that, you don't have enough folks to control the board, for example. So sometimes that's fine. Having a little piece of a great big prize is, is a good deal. You don't buy PT and T stock to control, to control the corporation, uh, but for an early stage, that's a consideration I would do, take into account. Does an advisory board have any legal liability to the company? Uh, an advisory board typically does not have any any legal uh, responsibility unless there's fraud in their advice. Uh, you know. If that, if that happens, you know, obviously the company or somebody can go after but they are not making decisions. They're giving you information, their opinion, and the board and the managers are the ones actually making the decision. They're the ones that have the responsibility. Uh, is there an investor network located here in Arkansas um, for uh, startups to reach out to? There are a number of very specific Shaska Bank investor networks. I'll go ahead and kind of spill the beans here right now. We're putting together a new investor network right now, and it will be accredited investors, and they will join a membership, and there'll be a, a, a committee that looks at, uh, does some real early due diligence on the companies and decide whether it's worth presenting to the group. And you present to the group and individuals will decide uh, whether whether to invest. And that's actually being put together now. So you probably hear about that in another month or two. Otherwise, it's there's a few little angel funds left, not very many, that have whatever criteria they have. Uh, the fund for Arkansas's future that I Top of start and they did two funds. Uh, concentrates on companies that are somewhat techy and based in Arkansas. That's the that's the criteria. There'll be some like our 
fintech funds that we raise money to invest in only companies in that in, in that one cohort and only the ones that look like they have the, the most problems. So there's some very specialized ones. Uh, anybody in here heard of the Hot Fund? Okay, so that's that's another you know investment possibility for early stage companies. So that's very worthwhile. That's very worth looking at. So is tech what most people are invested in right now, like the tech holes? Uh, the question was, is tech what most people are invested in? Not necessarily. Uh, you have different people with different tests, uh, different uh, interests. Tech's the one that probably has the biggest possibility for blowing the numbers out the top. Mm -hmm. But it's also the highest risk. Mm -hmm. So it just depends on the investor's level of, of risk. One more question. Yeah. The network you were speaking on, will they be smart investors? Like, would they be willing to also help to grow the company, or are they just like, here's some money and looking for a return? Are they smart investors that help them back? We envision them uh, being investors that will that will help and advise. Typically, if you know, say there's 100 people in the network and five or six decide they want to invest in your company it's probably because they have enough interest in what you're doing that, that they want that they want to help you okay. not guaranteed that's something you just have to kind of make the call on and, and doing that relationship learning about about each other yes the same you're going to predict in the cash flow statements especially in the emerging so can you talk a little bit about what would make you think that an assumption is correct or not an assumption about what? I was just, you get to, you know, data numbers. And uh, you don't always have, um, so you can go up and model the similar company. So you have to uh, go for, like, make up the numbers. Yeah, having a model of a similar company is a good place to start. What the investors looking like it have is basically their experience. They're, they're looking at, you know, other companies they've seen, other companies they've invested in companies they've been on boards of, friends, whatever. So they're they're basing that on their experience uh, when, when they look at that. So that's kind of all over the place. You've got very sophisticated investors that really understand financials and costs and stuff to, down to the great detail. And you've got others that say, oh, gee, I just like that product. That's neat. So that, that's kind of all over the place. It's kind of all those pieces we've just been talking about. You look at the performer, and you know you make a, a feeling based on that, and you really look at what's the marketplace, and you, you know, what's the opportunity in, in selling that product, and then you start discounting it from whatever kind of risk factors you see. So there's not a magic formula there. Uh, there are much more reliable formulas after you're an ongoing business and you've got you know regular sales and revenue and and you look to see you know what are they changing to so what's going to change that that directory that uh, trajectory uh, so that's a little bit more systematic but in the really early stage is it's you know look at the opportunity look at the marketplace look at the team look at the performance discount for the risk factors. And you'll see people that, well, you'll see people that just really kind of rip you off, to be honest, but you'll also people that say, well, you say it's worth $4 million, it's a whole lot riskier. Yeah. I'm, will, I'm willing to invest in a $2 million uh, valuation. You know, do, you, do you want my money or not? And you have to make a decision, or you try to negotiate something in between. These things are all negotiable. Now, when you have multiple investors, they can't sell to person A at, at one price and person B at another price. That's fraud. Uh, but typically, you'll find kind of a lead investor that you'll end up negotiating terms that you that you feel 
okay with if you feel excited about it and I think investor probably wasn't the right investor if you feel totally ripped off about it that's probably not the right investor either um, so somewhere in between and if neither one of you are excited it's probably the right value, <coughs> right valuation uh, but a little bit more of an art than a science to be honest on the on the early early stage situation but a lot of it you get a sophisticated investor and they've probably looked at hundreds and hundreds of companies and they really kind of have a pretty good feel about what's a possibility again it's only a possibility they, they still can fail yes can you talk about some advantages and disadvantages uh, equity investment versus traditional debt um, okay yeah equity versus debt uh, Equity, if you're really successful in the long term, is the most expensive financing because that's growth in ownership. Stock market is the stock price goes up, whatever, twice, 5x, 10x. That's a whole lot more than you would have paid in, in, in the interest. But I've also seen a number of companies that one way or another were able to borrow a, a lot of money couldn't make the payments on the debt, and they still went under. So, advantage of equity is you don't have to pay it back. You know, they get paid back if they sell their stock to somebody else or, or you exit the company. So, you don't have to pay the money back, you don't have to pay interest on it, unless it's some kind of preferred issue, and sometimes those will have dividends on there that act like interest. Uh, the advantage of debt is you didn't give up ownership. You've got all of the upside still on you, but you got to pay it back. You got to, you know, make those payments when they're due. So it's kind of a balancing act. And again, I'm sorry, I'm giving you a very good answer. Any other questions? Okay, Ashley. Super beneficial too if you're looking to fill that out. It's a 23 minute video that walks you through step by step how to fill this out. Um, some other things, we've got tons of programs coming up. Salesforce, if you're interested in having a CRM for your company, we've got a, a representative with Salesforce coming in November 13th. Uh, that's a Wednesday, 5.30 to 7 p.m. Same place right up here, so that's a good one to look into. Lift the Rock is coming up on November 15th. If you want to learn from Kathy Peck, Kathy Webb, those are both city directors and entrepreneurs here in Little Rock, as well as Brian Kutch with the Little Rock Zoo, and I'm told he's going to bring a furry friend with him, or a skelly friend, I'm not exactly sure, we'll just have Brent, who's the director of the tech park, turn his head that day so he doesn't see that happening. Uh, and then last but not least, um, we're having a pitch and pint. How many people have come to pitch and pint? Oh... So everyone in here is invited to Pitch and Pipe. That's December 10th. It's going to be at South on Main, further down into to Little Rock. Um, that is an elevator pitch competition that takes place. We'll have a panel of judges who also happen to be investors. Judge up to 25 folks with businesses, and they will pick their favorite along with audience favorites. There's a chance to win $5,000 with judge's choice and an additional $1,000 if you happen to be the audience choice. Uh, the criteria for that is you need at least $25,000 in annual recurring revenue. You need to be in business five or less years, and your business needs to be based here in Little Rock. Sorry, Arkansas, not Little Rock. Arkansas based. So, whether you want to pitch or just attend, all that information is on our website. Learn more about our programs on our website and follow us on Facebook. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.